Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, starting a new book today, The Epistles of John. John was the writer of both the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Revelator. That is to say, God speaking through him brought forth the book of Revelation. Uh, this one that Christ loved and certainly used him. John, of course, in the Hebrew tongue means Yahweh's gift. And indeed, he was a gift. And to the epistle, do you want to remember what he said? He, he was always concerned and is always concerned about the beginning. That, that you look at the beginning, even into the first earth age. Because if you don't understand the first earth age in the beginning, you've got blinders on. It's very difficult for you to see the truth. And seeing the truth is basically what this epistle is about. It is not addressed to any particular church or any particular individual. It simply is an open letter and it applies to all. But remember what he said in the gospel. He started it out, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So it is his word that brings us the truth the knowledge and the wisdom. And certainly he will report this as someone that when the word became flesh as it's written in the Gospel of John chapter 1, became flesh, John walked with him, loved him, followed him. And so we're, we're going to get a first-hand witness um, to that fact. So having said that, chapter 1, verse 1, the great epi first epistle of John, and it reads, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That is to say, we've touched that eternal life. We've felt it. You know, he has reference here in a sense all the way back to the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44, in the beginning whereby he said you were there. And you see, this pertains to two spirits, the evil and the good. And in the beginning, you had both. He said you, you were of your father, the devil of the first murderer from the very beginning in St. John chapter 8, verse 4. Back to the beginning again. And it's important that you go back to the beginning. You know, if you do not understand the beginning, there's no way you can ever understand the end. It's that simple. There's nothing complicated about it. And that's what John is pulling forth here. Uh, again, the reference on that was St. John chapter 8, verse 44, from the beginning. Verse 2, For the life was manifested, that's to say Christ, in Christ, and we have, have seen it and bear witness. We're a witness to it. And show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. It was made known to us, the truth, the Word. That's why the Word is so powerful and bless, blessed be the fact that it never changes. God is the same yesterday, He is today, and He will be forever. And this is what is so beautiful about understanding eternal life. Those that love Him are going to be together forever. This is not just a passing thing, but forever, even as it was in the beginning, even in the first earth age. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And wherever you have the Father and the Son, you also have the Holy Spirit. 
the triune head of Almighty, head of, of, of God Himself, of leading the children. And where those two are, can you imagine? Think about it. He says, We can fellowship through that spirit, through that comforter. We can fellowship with God Himself and with Christ. And in that attain eternal life. Well, how do we do that? Through truth. Truth is so valuable. And this is why you fellowship with Christ. Sometimes you get a little confused. Sometimes something may not be perfectly clear. Then you, how do you fellowship? You communicate. You talk to Him. You ask His blessings, His leadership, His clarity whereby you can see the very truth itself in life. For Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. It's life, eternal life. Verse 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. We, it is our desire that you know how it was in the beginning, that you pick up on that fellowship. And when you fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with we that even carried forth the truth from the beginning, that it makes you happy. Your joy runs over. And what a joy it is. You know, you don't, don't ever let someone rob you of that joy. It's real easy to do it, to listen to the traditions of men. They'll put shackles on you. They'll put you in bondage instead of setting you free, which God's Word does. Fellowship with him, talk to him. Verse 5. This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I mean, it is obvious that uh, he illuminates your knowledge, your wisdom. He enlightens you where you can clearly see that truth and, and with understanding. And, and so it is. And there is so much written in that. All prophecies pertaining to Almighty God are given in light days. All prophecies given to Satan are in darkness, that's to say moons at night. It's such a simple thing. The way God has the boundaries to the word of the good spirit and the bad spirit whereby you are forewarned, whereby you can enjoy and draw from fellowship with God himself through the comforter, through the mansion he prepared for us, which is to say Mino, as he would write in that eighth, in the Gospel of John in chapter 14, that, that mansion is the word Mino, which means to a resting place. That's what Sabbath is, is a place to rest, that you can rest in them by fellowshipping with them and enjoying with full joy the very Word of God and how it comes to pass. Uh, let there be no darkness in your eye, but the light that reflects the truth uh, from the beginning. Verse 6, you know, you're going to find that John likes to use this huge word, if, I-F. Okay. It's, it's conditional, and you want to watch it. A lot of times things won't go right for you. You might find that there's a qualifier to many of these sentences, these scripture. You've got to pay attention. we got one right here in verse uh, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. You, this is why you want to analyze your life, analyze yourself. If you walk in darkness and you can't see the light, the truth, if you can't illuminate yourself into the eternal life by fellowshipping with life itself, eternal life, you have a problem. You're, you're being misled somewhere along the way, maybe even misleading yourself by not accepting the simplicity in which Christ set forth the example in the Word becoming flesh and walking among us, the very simple way that He brought it forth is the way you should follow in fellowship. 
how wonderful it is to have the truth. Well, what is the truth? The Word. Verse 7, But if, there's that condition again, but if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, how many sins did it say that Christ's blood cleanses us from all sin? Well, now, wait a minute, brother. At our church, our deacons won't allow a divorcee to teach Sunday school. Uh-uh. Like to keep them at the back of the church. Well, then you're serving a bunch of hypocrites. They're not following God's word. Because it very clearly states there that the blood of Christ cleanses all sins except the unpardonable sin. And it's certainly not divorce or nor is it idolatry or adultery. Those sins are forgivable in the blood of Christ when you fellowship, when you walk with Him, when you are in Him. Don't ever, if you're attending a church that puts people in bondage, then you're not in a Christian church. I know that may offend some, but be that as it may, if your church does not teach that Jesus Christ can wash away all sin, then you're, you're putting crutches on Christ himself and limiting him. God is not happy with that. God does not like that. Not one iota. The Son cleanses us from all, A-L-L, -L, all sin. Uh, it is true that sin abounds, and it's in the world. But once one truly repents, it is the Christian thing from the beginning to know you have forgiveness. Our Father does not hold grudges. He, he even goes as far in many places to say, I don't even want to hear about it again. Once you repent and I forgive you, that's it. Done. Over with. Verse 8. If, there's that condition again. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It's very difficult for, for um, to live in a flesh body and not sin in one way or the other. It may be against health laws. It may be too much sugar in your diet. It could be many, many things that you might overbalance or unbalance. The, the very food you eat or or fall short in one way or another. You know, it's so difficult. And, but then there's always repentance. And that atonement, the blood of Christ, that's why he died on that cross. Was so that, well, how, how many times a day? He said 490. Seven times 70. I don't think any of you are that kind of a sinner. Repent. Be forgiven and have, fill yourself in the joy of fellowshipping with the Father and the Son. Verse 9, a big old if again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You don't, don't read over that. And don't let somebody rob you from it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How precious it is. You know, God loves His children. He truly does. Those that love Him. Those that are trying. And yet, nobody's perfect. But those that try, that fellowship, that talk, that commune, then there's always that hope. Verse 10, another big word. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and his word is not in us. Uh, this is an humbling th thought. We, we do fall short. And, and it comes back to a saying from the Old Testament that our, the very best of our righteousness is as filthy rags with Almighty God's righteousness. We, we can't compare. We do fall short. We're in the flesh. Flesh is weak. But that does not prevent you from trying and still communicating 
and having that joy of eternal life with our Heavenly Father and that Son and that Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He that stands between you and your enemies. That's who, what the Comforter, that's His obligation and His duty. Is He stands not only between you and Almighty God, that isn't necessary if you love Him, but between you and your enemies. He always gets the job done. You can count on it. That's something to really joy about. How precious it is. It is an humbling thing to know that even in the flesh when we fall short, that He still loves us when we confess and we repent, ask His forgiveness. He's always there to forgive and He will and He'll forgive all. Again, don't, don't let anyone rob you of that. And again, you're going to have some people that'll say, well, our deacons won't let this happen or that happen. Well, you've got a bad bunch of deacons. You need, a, you need to change the oil in the place. Okay. I speak of spiritual oil. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, how tender he writes. Okay. These things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. That's a comforter. Okay. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um, th this carries a little more weight than the sin spoken of in the prior chapter. The very fact that um, the word that, and you with companion Bibles, it'll, it will back this fact up, that this is speaking of an habitual sinner. So someone that really just doesn't care. Um, and... Um, he doesn't want you to go that route, to, to be so wired into the world that you forget about our Father, that you forget about the Son, that you forget about fellowshipping when that's where your advocate is, when that's where your comforter is. And when you live in this world without a comforter, you're in a one heap of hurt. I mean, bad, big time. Because, again, Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. That advocate is going to look out for you. That advocate is going to intercede in your life and cause good things to happen where you're going to stumble into bad things on your own. Don't do it. If you communicate, if you hold close to that advocate, that comforter, repent. And whatever you do, this is where he would say in another place that Christ himself would say, don't ever call a man a fool. And the word fool there is not like um, uh, foolish. It's moranus, which means an habitual sinner that cares nothing about God, wants to know nothing about God, doesn't believe in God, and wants no part of God. That's why he said, don't, don't ever get yourself in that condition. Because you lose the advocate, you lose the comforter. Quite frankly, you lose everything. You even lose your eternal life. How sad that is. When God doesn't show preference to his children that want to try, that love him, that live with that advocate in their life, that comforter, he intercedes. And what a difference it makes in a life. That's what brings joy. That's what brings happiness, is to have the comforter in your life interceding, taking care of those things that you cannot take care of yourself. Verse 2, And he is the propitiation, that is to say the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, whomsoever will. What a wonderful father we have. You know, and this is why this book is not necessarily titled to one particular church or one particular set of people, but to whomsoever will. That he paid that price for everyone. Conditional? Yes, because you have to believe. You have to follow and you have to what is a great help where you can be more useful to him is to understand the beginning so that you can help in the end. 
verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if, there's that condition, if we keep his commandments. Uh, you, you want to do your best to keep the commandments. They keep you out of trouble. The commandments are God's advice in your life whereby you can kind of handle it on your own with his, especially with his help in following those commandments. Do your best with them. If you fall short, repent. The Father knows and Father understands. Father knows His children. And, you know, how he, he is so very proud of those that He can depend upon. That He knows are solid. Do your best in following His advice. Not the advice of the world. Not the advice of man but the advice of Almighty God. Verse 4, He that saith, I, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Um, <clears throat> and it, it is true. Now, don't, I don't want anyone to put themselves on a guilt trip here. Christians are real bad about that. They like to get on a guilt trip. and <clears throat> well, Instead of getting on a guilt trip, repent. You messed up. Face it. You're not perfect. You do fall short. Repent. Fellowship with Him. Praise Him. Love Him. And let Him intercede in your life. Give you comfort <coughs> and, and help. And, and know that you, you work at keeping those commandments. Verse 5, But whoso keepeth His word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. You can feel the spirit. This is how the word of God is perfected. It becomes real. Do you want that to happen in your life? Do you want to have God's word perfected? Come to completion in your very life? that people can see the intercession of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, because you are fellowshipping with the Godhead, with our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. That, that brings about the perfected service to, to, of God's Word, the truth. That is the truth. To feel the presence of that Holy Spirit when He touches you. How comforting that is. That's why we call Him the Comforter. Verse 6. He that saith he abideth in Him ought himself also so to walk even as we walk. In other words, you want to you stay in the Word, absorb that Word, but most of all, let's simplify it. Stay in the light. Don't go in the darkness. Anytime something becomes confusing to you, whereby you cannot see clearly, you're in the dark. You need to stop a moment. Fellowship. Ask for light, which is to say truth, and be in that word. It is, it is the perfecting of the presence of Almighty God in your life. Verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment, I'm not going to do that unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. Again, we go all the way back. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. God's word never changes. That's the beauty of it. God's love never changes. God's light never changes. God's presence never changes. When He touches you, when He leads you, when He blesses you. <clears throat> there, as it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, there's nothing new under the sun. That that has been shall be again. What comes around, what goes around comes around. There's no surprises when you're in the Word and in the truth, when you're serving Him. And so it is in the beginning, how it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. 
Let there be no surprises. Surprises, when, when you are surprised, it means you've overlooked the truth, for in the truth there are no surprises. You know how, what to expect because you understand the revelation. And the revelation, God always gives us sign and understanding for the season, the season that you're immediately in, whereby you can better protect yourself and the people around you. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. All you have to do is participate in it. It's yours for the taking, and uh, and so it is. What what a what is the new light? What is the new commandments? The New Testament. It's the testament of Jesus Christ when the Word became flesh, when it walked among us, when He taught, and even that when He gave us two commandments to replace all of them. All were covered, and there was nothing new under the sun. But what did take place was God saw fit that if he would ask us to be born in the flesh, to document whether we would love him or Satan, that he himself came in the flesh himself in the Son. For if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, whereby within that he saw fit to let the Word become flesh and walked among us, bringing clarity, comfort, and fellowship. So stay in that light. It's with us. We live it. We can understand it. Verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. You just can't really quite do that. Now, this is probably one of the most misunderstood scriptures in God's Word. This is a brother is one born to the womb. Okay, you got it? This type brother. It is not possible to get along with all brothers, but you don't have to hate them. You exhort them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, begin reading. It tells you to handle how to handle a brother, not to hate him as Cain hated Abel, but how to handle him Set him aside. You see, it is not possible to get along with all people. And sometimes there must be attitude adjustments. That's life. That's human, that's human nature. And so, therefore, but many people, uh, why, why do I say that? Well, we live in a world that we get people that get on drugs. First one thing and first then another. And and um, they do things that you want to put away from you. You can even, if you say, if I hate him, I still must love him, then you can become an enabler if you're not careful. This is why it's important that you be familiar with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6, on how to treat a brother that simply will not adhere to the Word of God or family uh, tradition. So don't get yourself again on a guilt trip if you have to correct a brother. That's true love. Tough love is true love. Verse 10, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. In other words, um, what is that light? Well, it's Christ, of course. And if you walk in that light, and if you do according to Christ's word with your brother, then you have nothing to work. There's no occasion for stumbling yourself. You handle it the way Christ said to handle it. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, begin reading with verse 6 to the end of the chapter. Tells you how to handle it gracefully with love and success from Almighty God. Verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Um, he can't see. Hate is a form of insanity. Hate is a terrible thing. 
You know, when, when you're a child, you kind of speak as a child, but when you become an adult, you mature, especially a Christian adult that absorbs the Word of God that is in the light and sees the weakness of a brother and is able to help him in one form or the other. And sometimes the only help is tough love where you have to put him away from you. Okay? But don't treat him as an enemy, but admonish them, correct them, let them know why. Communicate. And, but set, set yourself apart from them and, and don't get it on a guilt trip. But to deliberately hate a brother with no forgiveness making no effort whatsoever to find a way for forgiveness. This is one that would hate out of um, that form of insanity that is hate itself. You know, most often, I know from counseling that when a brother hates a brother, many times they have been offended. They think of themselves quite more important than they really are. They weren't, they really, when, when uh, you know, when they think of self and self only, they're self-righteous, then you'll get to the bottom of the situation. Okay. And, and certainly that can bring out hate. And hate is very damaging. It damages a whole family. You can't have that. You have to have peace and understanding to the point of putting a brother to the side. Hey, you're here. I can't get along with you because you will not adhere. Therefore, you're over there. I'm over here. So be it. Okay. That's correction. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And there you have it. His name. Well, what's his name? Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. He's in the business of saving lives, not destroying them. He's in the business of lighting lives up and bringing them from the darkness into the light where there's joy and hope and eternal life. Whereby they can be a blessing to all they come in contact with. Tough love, close love, fellowship in family and with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John is a tender writer, but he doesn't beat around the bush. He lays it down just like it is where emotionally we can feel the very presence of God in the Word itself from the beginning. Don't miss any of these lectures. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Uh, please never ask a question about a particular religion, denomination, or reverend. We're not, we don't judge people. That's not our right. You can discern, evaluate, but never judge. Okay. Um, that's our father's op, um, job, and he does, not, he does not need our help in judging people. He saves that all to himself. So, 
um, when, when you write, uh, remember that. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request, you don't need the number. You don't need an address. You just need to talk to him. Do you know something? He, you don't even have to say it out loud. He knows what you're thinking. He's your father, and he loves you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, I, I want to thank Dennis for filling in and um, teaching a book and giving um, yours truly a little opportunity to catch up um, the farm and ranch and have everything going real good. I enjoy it. Good to be back, and let's get right into it. Della from Montana. I live in a small town, and I see how many people get hurt by gossip and rumors. Please tell me, is there a place in our Father's Word that speaks or teaches about gossip or rumors? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 will help you a lot, and whether uh, you, you will have gossipers. I think probably the best lesson that a person can learn, I very rarely ever encourage one to read the Apocrypha. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with the Apocrypha. But there is a little book in the Apocrypha called Susanna. And um, this Susanna was a beautiful young girl and unmarried. And she walked in the garden each day, exceptionally beautiful. And two Kenites saw her and threatened her saying, you will either either lie with us or we're going to say we saw you with a man in here which at that time would have been bad, bad news. Okay. And so she, she told them to go fly a kite, okay, my words. And they did, followed up and passed the word, they, what they had seen her doing there in the garden. And everybody was saying, did you hear about Susanna? <laughs> Poor Susanna. Oh, Susanna, she's gone. It's gossip. And Daniel came along. And they asked Daniel, what do you think about Susanna? And he said, think what? He said, um, in other words, he knew it was gossip and he knew it wasn't true. And they said, well, what, why, why, why don't you feel bad about Susanna? He said, bring one of those out to me and send the other away for a moment. And they brought him one of the Kenites. And he said, under which tree did you see this happening? Well, under that sycamore right there. Okay, very good. Now you, you go away, bring the other one. Under what tree did you see this happen? Under that oak tree right there. He said, hang both of them. You know, that, now that's what gossip, I think that's one of the best gossip stories, which it, it, I guess it actually happened. I don't guess it did. It's an extension of the great book of Daniel. Yeah, you know, the, the community would have destroyed Susanna. Beautiful, intelligent, wonderful person. And wisdom and truth saved her. But gossip would have destroyed her. Many people are hurt severely by gossip, especially on now that we have the internet and, and the Twitter tinkle, tinkle uh, little people trickling and letting their little brain bleed off, you know. It, it hurts people, and it has even caused some deaths. It's a sad state of affairs. Words are dangerous when they're idle. That's why it's better to fellowship with Almighty God and let your speech be uh, beautiful and rewarding and educational and light. Uh, Jeanette from uh, California, I was never taught the Antichrist would come first. Uh, I know, that's, and that is sad, because God's word from beginning to end teaches that, basically, that he will come first and deceive many people. My question is, in Psalms chapter 30, verse 9, David believed he was going down in the pit. I believe to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And it is true. What David was saying, our, David's body did go in the grave. But he, naturally, 
the instant the body went in the grave, he went to the Father. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Father. But um, And uh, follow that up with Acts chapter 2, and it will tell you Christ was transfigured. His body did not go in the grave. It resurrected, transfigured. But David stayed in the grave. But his spirit and soul naturally returned to the Father that gave it. It is really a sad thing that most people do not teach. When the main Gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, and throughout the book of John, speaks of the false Christ coming first and God's elect being delivered up before it. I don't know how they get around that. And because of uh, one little doctrine that lets people have a little safety blanket and they fly away, which is a lie. It's kind of sad. It does not prepare people to meet the maker. Michelle from Tennessee, who can baptize another person and what is the proper way to baptize someone? And who are the Kenites? I'll take the last first. Kenite is a Hebrew word that means Cain's children, his offspring. Uh, you know, I, I teach that any Christi Christian can baptize another Christian. Now, not all churches will accept that baptism. Christ will. Almighty God will accept it. Okay, But a lot of churches won't. So just be forewarned before. Uh, because if you have the intention of joining a certain church, um, your baptism, they will not unless one of their reverends uh, have accomplished the feat, probably they would not accept it. Okay, so, but Christ will, that's what's important. Cheryl from Georgia. What scripture says if we commit murder with malice, send them to the Father? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, Numbers chapter 35, and Christ himself teaching, I have not changed one jot of the law, for those that kill, the word is fognance, criminal, homicide, murder, you're going to fry, okay? You're going to be judged is what it says in Father's judgment. We don't judge. Alberta from Kentucky. Where in the Bible is it found that the devil will be turned to ashes in the lake of fire? Well, naturally in, in, um, in Revelation chapter 20, he is cast into the lake. But to be turned to ashes from within, you will read in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, where he, this, this goes all the way back into the first earth age when he rebelled, brought about the katabo. And, and um, he, he had been elevated to one of the highest positions in the angelic world. He was a cherubim that his duty was to cover the mercy seat. That's, that's Christ's own seat. And then he became proud of himself and fell and um, led a third of God's children aside and turned them away from God. So God tells him in that 28th chapter of Ezekiel, I will, you will be turned to ashes from within. That is uh, Hebraism meaning fini over. But it really happens in Revelation chapter 20. Robert from Pennsylvania, please explain 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And in Revelation, where it says, feet will with polished brass and hair like sheep's wool. Is this describing Christ? Overall, with the brightness and, and so forth, yes, it is in his transfigured body. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, um, it's kind of strange that you would ask this as speaking of the Olympics. Okay. That w when you, when you um, run a race, watch out how you run that race. I mean, you take, get rid of every weight that dispels you. We're talking about serving Christ. Or else that you might be rejected yourself. You, you do it honestly and fairly. You run that race, okay, of life. Rodney from Illinois. I want to know what Sheila means uh, and what's the current pronunciation. Sheila. You find it in the Psalms, basically. And 
it is a musical terminology. And it serves a very important place. It means stop and think. You put this mind in gear and you meditate. What it always does is a statement has just been made that is usually a question, let's say, in, in many instances. And then it will, after the question is asked, it will say, stop the music. Think on that question. And then following, it gives you the answer. Or it will give you a condition, then stop the music, seal it, and then it will explain how to, to live with that condition. That's, that's what it is about. It's to stop, to meditate, to chew the could a moment, think about it, and um, move forward. Always use wisdom and think in the light, and you will do well. Um, a, uh, Amanda from North Carolina. Can you tell me where in the Bible it talks about the Nephilim coming to the son of Adam or when they come to the son of Adam? It's the daughters of Adam. Okay, They came to the daughters of Adam in Genesis chapter 6. It's the Nephilim comes from the Hebrew base prime root Natha, which means fallen and angels. Okay, it's fallen angels is what the Hebrew word means. And in Genesis chapter 6, they, they saw how beautiful in the daughters of Adam were. Through, and naturally it was Satan's doings because Satan knew that through the daughters of Adam would come Christ. And uh, he had already tried to destroy this in the womb of Eve. And now he was trying in all the daughters and he failed. Because there was one that was perfect. His genealogy was perfect. That's, that's biblical and that's what it says. Like it or lump it. That was um, Noah and his whole family. They had not intermixed with the Geba, the fallen angels, Nephilim. John from Missouri in the scripture. That's Genesis chapter 6. John from Missouri. In the scriptures where it says we are to come out of Babylon, does this mean... We are to physically leave Babylon or spiritually leave Babylon. Well, let's, let's break it down. What does Babel mean? What does Babylon mean? Well, it comes from the prime root Babel. And Babel means confusion, just to babble something that has no meaning, no understanding, uh, just terribly confused. And you got a lot of that today, even in churches. A church that will put you in bondage. You're in Babylon. They're, they're, they're making prisoners out of you when the truth is supposed to set you free. Okay. That's, that's the beauty of Christianity is freedom. And don't ever let someone rob you of that. But um, how do you come out of Babel? You learn truth and you come into the light. You come into truth. You study the prophecies written in God's word because Babylon is coming in the end times. Oh, man, is it strong. And man, is it on top of us. But the truth is always there if you pull it out from God's word and um, how precious it is for God's fellowship in alerting us and warning us. Um, and uh, this spring, we're going to see some wonderful things happening. I can promise you that. Cheryl from Louisiana. The Bible said if more than one person prays, like two or three, that prayers would be answered. Does that mean apply only if there are two or more? Or will God answer prayers if um, there is only one person praying? He, he will answer if just one person is praying. If you meet the conditions, you got to be honest with him. Uh, when, when two or three pray, that, that's good. That is good. It impresses our Heavenly Father. But God loves all of His children. And, and naturally, if, if one prays a prayer, He's going to hear it. That does not necessarily mean that He's going to answer it the way you would want it to, but He's going to answer it what's best for you. You have to love Him enough and trust Him enough to know that's the way it is. Uh, Robin from Kentucky. Will there be more than 100, the 144,000 elect who will go to heaven? Oh my goodness, yes. 
You know, as it is written in the seventh chapter of Revelation where it mentions the 144,000, if you'll keep reading on in that seventh chapter, you will read there where you can't even number those at that time that had already washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. You couldn't count them. God's elect simply are witnesses, and God's very elect will pull the 144,000 that will witness in the end times, and that time is coming. Lori from Montana, but that, that has nothing to do with who goes to heaven. That's teaching God's word and getting the truth, the light uh, turned on where people can come into that light. Lori from Montana. What is the difference between revenge and getting even? Well, getting even is where you do, uh, you correct practicing tough love, where it becomes a teaching um, maneuver. A and it may be pretty severe on the person that uh, uh, committed the offense, whatever it might be. But God will bless that. If you see that, um, um, I, I mean, leave them a little room to stand on. Don't destroy them. And explain how wonderful it is if they would just step out and come on to the Lord and be blessed. That way, you, it is a teaching thing. And you, you kind of drop the hammer on them and make it hurt sometimes. That's tough love. But it's better to be hurt by the hammer I'm that's a figure of speech. Now, don't go get a sledgehammer and start banging around on people. I, that, that means financially, through love or otherwise, correct. And it can be tough, pretty tough love. And, but uh, revenge is where you just simply, I mean, bought somebody out and just destroy them and leave them no hope or anything else. If at all possible, do not ever correct a parent in front of his children okay, or a mother in front of her children. Always take them off to the side and correct uh, away from the child. Unless it's something severe, then sometimes you have to do it that way. But always give somebody enough room that they can recover. And that, that's... Uh, that's kind of like getting even being a teacher at the same time. Example setter. Marge from Minnesota, would you please explain the one world system? The, the one world sp system spoken of uh, in God's word is the whole world that will whore after the false Christ. It is the only time that a one world system will totally come into being. But it will receive a deadly wound and um, uh, to bring it into power. That happens at the sixth trump, the sixth seal, and the sixth vial, 666. And uh, so it is. Uh, Joe from West Virginia. In Matthew 24, during the days of Noah, would you please explain the two men in the field and the two women grinding uh, and the one taken and one left? This, this is where the, it speaks of the coming of the Antichrist. Okay? What were they doing in the days of Noah? Dancing, drinking, and giving in marriage. Giving in marriage to who? The fallen angels. The question before, the Nephilim. Okay? The fallen angels are coming back again. Satan and his angels are going to be kiss, kicked out onto the earth. And those evil angels, again, this is Christ's teaching, are going to be looking for women. You don't want to be deceived by them. And naturally, the subject, just it is straight, uh, the law of uh, literature, the subject is the coming of Antichrist. That you are not to be deceived or taken. Because the one taken is taken by Antichrist, not by Christ. The one that stays in the field, God, that's the world working until the true Christ returns at the seventh trump, finds salvation. That's part of deception, and yet the simplicity that is within it is simply fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's his words. It's his sermon in Matthew 24. You need to listen to it. Do you know a beautiful thing about it? It and Mark 13 both. 
seven things are mentioned. They are the seven seals, the seven trumps, and the seven vials. All of Revelation is answered in that one chapter, if you can dig it out. Brenda from Georgia, is there a hell? Can you please give me some scripture to prove there is no hell and that Satan is the only one going to hell? There is definitely going to be a burning hell. Does it exist yet? No, it doesn't. In, uh, in God's word, if you will take the time to take your strong concordance, anytime the word hell is used, it is either suel or Gehenna in the Greek, suel in the Hebrew. It, it, it is the grave or a supplica. Okay. But in the end, in Revelation chapter 20, there is a lake of fire and God is a consuming fire. Do you know what a consuming fire is? That's one, a fire that consumes things. Um, and then you can learn a great deal by reading Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not those that can kill your flesh body, but he that can cause your soul to perish, meaning be consumed, done away with. That's our Heavenly Father. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it. It's his letter to you. It is his word. It is his light. It makes his day when you get into that word. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But you know what's most important, though? It's this, your life. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.